Welcome back all, Dr. JC here, week three. Week three, we're going to break into four parts, fairly brief compared to some of the previous lectures. And we're going to look at, over these four parts, some salient events that occur in Europe specifically, but are going to have a global impact. The first part, which we'll discuss here, is on the Renaissance. In part two, we'll cover the Reformation. Part three, this age of discovery or age of exploration. And in part four, the scientific revolution and enlightenment periods. So let's jump right into the Renaissance here, part one. The Renaissance quite literally means rebirth. And it's rebirth. This is where Europe is re-emerging from that wrenching change that was the Black Death. If you recall in the lecture on the Mongols and the Black Death, I mentioned that individuals in European society, they went to their feudal lords and they went to their local Catholic priests and bishops and asked for answers. What's going on here with this Black Death? They weren't given answers. And therefore those individuals said, you know what, maybe we'll look to science, we'll look to nature, and we'll look back into the classical period. What did the Greeks do? What did the Romans do? Why was Greek and Roman society so great? So maybe we need to look back and look elsewhere in order for us to move forward. And that's what the whole basis of the Renaissance is. Akin to the Black Death itself, the Renaissance or rebirth is going to take place in Italy and spread northward. Well, clearly we could spend some time in Venice and Milan as well. We have to talk briefly here about Florence. It's best remembered as the Queen City of the Renaissance, and rightfully so. Interestingly enough, it's not just the artisans that we come to recognize from Florence here, the Leonardo's, the Michelangelo's, Cellini's, Giotto's, and others. It's also the Medici family. This is where banking and capital and credit and capitalism really do start to take firm hold in Europe. Therefore, Florence really can be in some ways viewed as or remembered as the breaking of the modern world, especially as it relates to the European trajectory of power that's going to come. Much of that associated not just in the arts, but also in the sciences. And whether you're doing arts or sciences, you got to have some coin to back that. And that's where the Medici's come into play. So as part of this rebirth, there are two major themes or subtopics that are components of the Renaissance. The first has to deal with state building. We're talking about kings and queens reestablishing the monarchy. And in fact, we're going to start to see this trend towards absolute monarchy. We'll get to that a little bit later. And then the second subtopic is humanism. Key point to make here as it relates to humanism. Do not, do not misassociate humanism here in the Renaissance period with secular humanism, parlance from the present day. Secular humanists today are individuals that believe in the complete division of church and state. In fact, they'll go to the full extent of even trying to pull down religious symbols from county seals and so on and so forth, for good or ill, depending on how one views it. Humanists here in the Renaissance period, however, they do not eschew God. They do not say God is a poo-poo. They do not say God is dead or doesn't exist. In fact, it's quite the op opposite. They say that, you know what, if God created this earth, God or nature's God created all things, then maybe we need to look to science and nature for answers as well because God would have placed them there. So this is not a separation of church and state. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And I do want you to keep that in mind. Among the various writings that will emerge during this time, we start to see philosophy and a sense of ethics brought back too from the Greeks and from the Romans. And that all writing that emerges, like those from the great so styled Tuscan triumvirate, the Dantes, Petrarchs, and Boccaccios of the world, the writing from these guys is meant to have a degree of lesson, but it balances the spiritual with the secular. Remember, as mentioned previously, humanism as it relates to the Renaissance does not separate church and state. It actually brings them together beyond the Medici family and money, beyond the state building, beyond the humanism. This rebirth of Europe, this Renaissance, really was about individualism. The rebirth of the individual, rather than having a place in society and a position in society you were expected to do, that was the Middle Ages. In the Renaissance, you now have the ability to rise based on your own merit and talent. Now, I mentioned previously that it's going to start, it being the Renaissance, start in Italy. And as mentioned on this slide here, it probably kind of makes sense why it's going to start in Italy because of geography. Italy is closest to the Byzantine world, closest to the Islamic world, 
They command trade throughout the Mediterranean world. And as a result of that, the Renaissance or rebirth is going to take place in Italy and, as mentioned, spread northward from there. As you may well imagine, as Italy becomes the center of trade, you're going to see an expanding middle class with some discretionary or extra income. With this extra income, they're wanting to do what? Engage in the arts, enhance their lives through painting and literature. Well, I'm not going to go into detail of other writers during the time that had very impactful and influential works like Sir Thomas More's Utopia or the so-styled prince of the humanists himself, Erasmus here, especially his praise of folly or freedom of the will. I am going to, however, take a little bit of time to talk about this cat, Mac Machiavelli. And I'm not talking about the rapper here. I'm talking about this cat. While I don't expect everyone to recognize this work, I'm certain that there are many of you that had to deal with Machiavelli's The Prince at some point, whether it's in high school or in a college lit course, whatever it might be. If you're unfamiliar with it, there are a couple key points I want to make here as it relates to The Prince, because it does reflect the change of time he, from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. And Machiavelli is writing as a way to instruct princes, kings, and queens on how it is they should go about governing. Now, there are other aspects within the prince as well. There's military aspects and so on and so forth. It really is about how one does bureaucracy, how one should create and run a state. It's important to note here that Machiavelli's prince has not necessarily been taken to be the most glamorous or positive of writings as it relates to how one does government governance, how one does control of the state. After all, the term Machiavellian, right, tends to imply someone's a little bit more shystery, trickstery, so on and so forth. But you have to understand that Machiavelli's worldview was one such that he didn't think most people were very good. It's a little bit different than my own worldview. I happen to think that if an Amber Alert goes up, we don't ask what color the kid is or if it's a boy or girl. We just start to try to help out. I think people are hardwired to be good. But for Machiavelli, I think he saw most people to be perhaps not so trustworthy. And if that's the case, then yeah, we should have stronger rules perhaps in place to control disorderly peoples, right? Therefore, the instructions that Machiavelli is prescribing here for kings and queens, and understand too, He's trying to let them know, them being kings and queens, you can claim to have divine right. You can claim that God or nature's God has pointed you here. But you're dealing with a new society, a new society in the sense that they don't necessarily view themselves as subjects, they view themselves as citizens, and that there is another new king or queen on the horizon here, and that's money, all right? Therefore, you need to recognize your place within this changing society. And as a result of that, you cannot cookie cutter approach your policies to any one group or every group. There are times when you need to play the fox and there are times you need to play the lion, Machiavelli would say. Times to apply the velvet glove to effect change, times to go ahead and use the iron fist to get your people to act the way you want to but you can no longer cookie cutter the way you do governance. You have to now take this view that I have to apply case by case, different policies, different provisions, different tactics to get people to behave, whether within my own borders or from a diplomatic standpoint, from a foreign affairs standpoint, other kings and queens as well. Thus, Machiavelli's work really does kind of reflect the larger ongoing changes here. It's not just individuals that are being impacted by this. It's the nobility and kings and queens as well. So the Renaissance in that regard really is a rebirth, not just of the individual and his or her place in the world, and not just of kings and queens and how they go about governance, but it's a rebirth, most importantly, of hope. Hope that perhaps finally the individual in Europe is going to break free from this cloud of misery that has shrouded their existence for seemingly hundreds of years. That the plagues, the infestations, the constant warfare, the uprisings, maybe all of this is going to be gone now. Maybe God or nature's God has finally cracked the clouds, let the sun pour in, and given us an opportunity as individuals to rise based on our own talent, our own merit, and our own ability. 
that individuals do matter that it doesn't matter who my daddy was or what what class I was born into I can rise based on my own hard work and talent and as a result of these changes we're going to see an explosion in not just the arts but in questions in science mathematics engineering and it's also going to begin to question religion and the power of the Catholic Church so as we move out of part one here and into part two which is going to deal with the Reformation the Protestant Reformation roots of the word protest and reform there we're going to talk about turmoil in the church and a breaking up of the Christian church. So let's leave the Renaissance here behind in part one. In part two next, we'll go to the Protestant Reformation. Dr. J.C. out, part one, lecture three.